Ah, so hi, uh, my name is Sarah. Uh, I work at Redfin, the technology real estate brokerage. And like Cody Lynn mentioned, uh, I did something called job crafting, which is I got hired as one thing and then I slowly started doing what I really wanted to do. Uh, and in turn, made up my own title. Uh, so I'm basically a, a people analyst. I do people analytics. Um, I do a lot of interviewing to kind of understand the state of the organization and really try to make sure that people like where they work. It's a pretty baller job and I really like it. Uh, so today, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about empathy. Uh, my background is in behavioral neuroscience. I am overeducated, uh, <laughs> and I uh, am really in love with soft skills. And I think a lot of times uh, people see soft skills as kind of a thing that they kind of have to do if they want to get promoted. Uh, but actually, soft skills require a lot of science and a lot of practice. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about empathy. So part of the DevOps process uh, so I've heard from all of my friends and people I don't know, is empathy. That empathy is required to work in DevOps. We talk typically about empathy uh, for having empathy for our customers, people who are using our products so that we can build good code that they'll actually use. But I want to talk about empathy for three things. Having empathy for ourselves, having empathy for our teammates, and working, uh, doing daily things in our daily work lives with empathy. Alrighty, so the first step in understanding others is to first understand ourselves. That's right, the more self-aware you are, the more empathetic you can be. And there are tools as behavioral psychologists use to do self-awareness, and actually Jennifer mentioned it yesterday at her opening. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about two personality assessments. Uh, <clears throat> the first personality assessment I wanna talk about is what we call DISC, or D-I-S-C. The DISC is a personality test that you take by ranking different personality traits, like accurate, competent, considerate, and decisive, on a forced choice scale, which means one of them has to be most like yourself, one of them has to be least like yourself. You do this a bunch of times, and a nice report comes out at the end. Uh, what I like about the DISC is that it's scientifically valid. It means it's been normed across a wide variety of samples and populations and different personality styles, so you're getting something that looks pretty scientific because it is. Your report looks something like this, uh, where your, your uh, personality is ranked on four traits. D, or decisiveness, I is interaction, S is stabilization, uh, and C is cautiousness. And basically, uh, the disc says the degree to which you are these four things comprises your personality. Your results are made up of two different bars. The colored bars here are what you call your natural style. That's how you tend to act in a normal way. And then the gray bars, your adaptive style, how you tend to act when you're being particularly aware of the situation or you feel like you have to act maybe differently than how you would want to. What I like about the disc too is that you're being ranked in relation to the rest of the personality traits. Instead of something like a Myers-Briggs that puts you in some sort of classification of your either, you know, INTS or I don't know, Myers-Briggs or ITJP, right? This, the disc is ranking you on a continuum. These are my personality results and you can see that I am both extroverted and introverted. It actually depends on the situation for me, but I am significantly more people-oriented than task-oriented. Given my job title and what I like to do, this shouldn't be super surprising. Then your results go into each individual uh, trait and tells you a little bit more about your personality style. Um, so this is an example of my decisiveness uh, um, score. And I'm kind of right in the middle. It's out of 100 and I'm at a 42 for natural. I'm at a 35 for adaptive. So I tend to maybe uh, play down my decisiveness when I feel like people are watching. Kind of an interesting thing here too 
Under my comments, it talks about most likely behavioral traits based on a combination of all of my scores. So my most likely behavioral traits are sometimes you demand too much of yourself. Ooh, yeah. Uh, and um, you're usually very supportive of decisions made by others on your team. Uh, the disk is really cool, too, because it also gives you things like strengths-based insight, so how you can use your personality um, that's combined for particular ways of success. So here, um, one of mine is that I bring a positive sense of humor uh, and try not to do it at the expense of others. Further, there is a really great page at the end of the disk that literally is written for people who are not you. It says communication insights for others, and then provides really good tips for how to communicate with me. One of my examples is be candid and open. Love that. Uh, break the ice with a personal comment. Love that too. Love stories. All right, so that was the disc. <laughs> Thanks for laughing at my joke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the second personality test I want to talk about is Clifton Strengths, sometimes called Gallup Strengths Finder, all the same thing. Uh, it is also a personality test that you are ranking force choice and personality traits. Uh, but then it spits out common language. There's only 34 traits, and it basically ranks your top strengths in relation to each other. So this is not going to surprise anybody. My top five strengths are learner, individualization, includer, relater, and positivity. And that sounds right up the alley of someone who cares about people and wants to learn more about them. Just like the disc, your strength reports include individual pages that talk about each of your strengths and gives you good ideas for how you can uh, look for workplaces that have those uh, traits. Further, there's actually ideas for action, just like the disc, that tells you a little bit more about your personality, um, specifically what you're good at, and then does provide some ideas for action of places where you may need to, to focus. Now, the biggest pushback I get when recommending personality tests are either, I've taken the Myers-Briggs, I know, I know what I am, uh, or some sort of you know, Facebook or BuzzFeed quiz. Um, or, you know, I've taken, I've taken one and it didn't really feel like me. Both valid feedback, but I would encourage you to take what I would call a psychometrically valid test. That means one that's been normed across a wide variety of samples and a wide variety of people uh, that will hopefully be more in tune with who you are. Very often, um, these personality tests won't be 100% accurate. Like, again, it's, it's normed, but it's not magic. I would consider it good if at least 80% of the statements about yourself are true. I'd consider that pretty darn good fit. I would really think about the other 20% that you think don't look like you. Maybe ask a friend or a colleague if really you're showing up differently than you intend. It's a great tool to understand more self-awareness. So these are just two personality and strengths assessments I've used in the workplace. Um, but there's also things like um, the predictive index or big five. Um, I just high uh, wholeheartedly recommend finding a psychometrically valid tool and then using that personality assessment to understand more about yourself and how you're showing up to work. So then the second part of empathy after we get self-awareness is perspective taking or the ability to understand others' perspectives. And by that, I also mean understanding your teammates and a little bit about them. Now, we are obviously all going to go to my resources right after this and take a personality test in your next break. Uh, so I would use that as a tool and share it with your teammates. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is what a PhD gets you, <laughs> sharing. What I like about this is that you are already getting this with one of these assessments, right? So sharing yourself with your teammates can then help them understand how to talk to you and how to work with you, and vice versa. Uh, so one of my uh, communication insights for others I kind of mentioned is break the ice with a personal comment. So I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, Katie 
Katy Perry and I were bonding yesterday over um, the fact that we both hold resentment towards our uh, uh, junior high teachers because of you know, a sassy thing that they said. Um, and that's so true. Uh, because my ideas for communication say, don't intimidate Sarah with position or power. It was true in seventh grade, and it is true today. <laughs> now, the cool part about this is that you don't even ha actually have to hand, sit down with your teammate to do this. You can just hand her this how-to tip for communication. But I actually recommend you talk to her, and potentially all of your teammates. So here is an example of something I went through with an actual team uh, using this, the Strengths Finder. We each took the strengths finder and came up with our top five strengths and then sat down together and talked about how we can work well together, um, how, uh, what strengths we needed for different tasks and who we could rely on for specific areas, uh, and also highlighted strengths that didn't happen on our team where potentially maybe somebody would have to fill in the gap and be unlike themselves to be able to, to ship a product. One of the vital steps to building trust with teammates is understanding where our colleagues are coming from. The last time someone new started in your workplace, did you ask them about a specific experience with programming? Did you ask them their favorite type of programming language or how much experience they had with a program? I see some nods. Yeah, right? Came up in the interview. But did you ask them how best they like to work? Did you ask them ways that you could potentially help them in their onboarding? How you could potentially introduce them to someone who may have a lot of domain knowledge about something that they're going to be working on? Interesting thing, we think we need to build trust with our teammates before being vulnerable, but research shows, Nicole drinking game, that it's actually the opposite. Being vulnerable with our teammates can actually increase team trust. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but actually teams that are more vulnerable with each other and thus have more team trust um, are able to ship their products faster, with less stress, and uh, with more team satisfaction. I'll say that again. Uh, trust within teams is positively related to task performance, and team satisfaction and negatively related with stress. Trust matters. Setting expectations with someone uh, who we work with is super important. And one way to set expectations about how you can work together <laughs> is to grab coffee. And this doesn't sound uh, like a big deal, but I think we tend to go get coffee at work with people who we actually like. And a lot of times, the places where we have conflicts are with people we don't like. One of the reasons why we may not like them is because we don't know them. Research shows that building effective work relationships is necessary because they form the basis for things like promotional opportunities, uh, hitting our goals, also getting uh, raises. It's important to have good relationships with people that we work with even if we don't really like them. And it sounds really simple because it is, but people just don't do this. Potentially, we would be able to understand someone more if we just took them out to coffee and had a conversation. There's a skill to these conversations, too. Think about what you actually want to know about and then ask them about it. Ask your colleague open-ended questions. Be curious. Follow up when something sounds cool. It sounds, again, easy, but people suck at these conversations, especially when they're with people who aren't friends. When you're having these conversations, I want you to forget any active listening tips you may have heard. You know what active listening is? It's like where you nod, lean forward and say, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's called faking paying attention. And if you have to fake paying attention, you're not actually paying attention. Allow yourself some vulnerability, and if the person that you're talking to says something that you can relate to, relate to them. Try not to one-up their story, just try to let them know that you understand. If they say some sort of story that has them overcoming a hurdle or they defeated some sort of adversity, do not respond with a phrase that starts with at least. 
That's not empathy. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. So try to say things like, wow, that sounds rough. How did you get through it? What can I do for you? Say you have sat down with a colleague, you've tried really hard, but you still feel like your relationship is difficult and you can't get over a hump. I challenge you to do a Gemba walk. We've all said something to the effect of, I just don't know what Jim does all day. And we're right, we do not. We don't know how often Jim is interrupted by someone who uh, potentially knows that he's the best and has the most domain knowledge about a topic. We don't know particular stresses of his daily work. Potentially, we'd be able to understand Jim, Jim a little bit more and have some more empathy for him just by asking him if we can watch him work or pair program with him. Gemba walks, also called go and sees, uh, shadowing your colleagues. It's a key principle of the Toyota production system, that lean and agile methodology, and really just says that you don't know what the work is like unless you see it. Uh, Ren, yesterday at Facebook, was telling me that one of the things that, he, that she did to get into uh, this type of mindset is actually invite another team to her team meetings and really understanding how people are working, what they're prioritizing can be really helpful. We typically use these phrases to understand how customers are using our product or how we can lean out a process and remember how you work is still a process. Just remember that if Jim is still working at your company, even if you think he is the biggest doofus, probably means that he has something to offer. You just have to be open to listening. And although Gemba walks, copy chats, and personality tests are all you know, kind of fluffy and it would be really hard to do all day, every day, we do have some uh, no room in our day to get work done if we did those every single day. So another way, super easy way to increase some empathy is what I call uh, a mood check-in. This mood check-in can be done in your daily or weekly stand-up. Before you go on to do a status check, do a mood check-in. This is a two-by-two two grid of mood on the, uh, the x-axis and energy on the y-axis. Go around and ask people where they are. I think you're going to, to change the way you talk to someone if they say that they're in quadrant three than if they say they're in quadrant one. And you don't actually have to worry uh, about this particular um, check-in if you don't like it. An engineering team I used to work with did thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, another one did a one to five scale where one was crappy and five was happy. It's just nice to understand before we talk about our work where everybody else is on an emotional level. And you don't even have to go into why you're a three versus a one. You can just tell people that you're checking in as a three. All right. So the last part of empathy is something that psychologists call emotion reappraisal. And that is just being able to change the trajectory of an emotional response by reinterpreting the meaning of a stimulus. In other words, it's being able, in an emotional situation, to recognize that it's emotional and change your perception about it. That's like, it's super hard. So the first step in being able to do this is to recognize that your decisions are wrought with cognitive biases. You may have heard the term unconscious bias, and it's actually typically uh, in reference to hiring. Right, being able to take out the bias in the hiring process by doing some sort of training, right? It's, it's still really important, but there's actually ways where you are, are contributing to cognitive biases and your brain is actually making connections that you don't even know are happening all the time. Maybe you are a subscriber to Textio. It's a um, cloud computing natural language processing software that then looks at job descriptions and pulls out gendered language. Uh, maybe you're doing blind hiring where you cover the degrees uh, and cover the names of your applicants to try to reduce some of that bias. All great tools, highly recommend them. But we are also pretty consistently making biases in our everyday lives with even people that we work with. For example, 
we are more likely to think that the most attractive person in the room is the smartest. And we tend to think people who look like us are the most attractive. We're more uh, likely to like people with whom we can find similarities. Yep. And we're more likely to think that the success that we get is due to hard work, but the success that someone else gets is due to luck or privilege. Now, I've told you uh, a personal story about myself. I've put up my personality traits uh, to a room full of strangers, and both of those are actually trying to use your cognitive biases for my benefit by trying to share myself and be vulnerable with you and hopefully make you care more about my talk and about empathy. Now, all of these cognitive biases that we have change how we interact with people at work. Reading up on some of them and really trying to, to understand the reasons why you like one person and may hate Jim is really important and can make you more empathetic. <laughs> this slide was for Amy, who I don't think is here. But. Uh, so now I'm going to talk to you about how you should react in specific emotional situations. That's kind of kind of true. I'm going to talk about how you can control situations that you know are going to be emotional. That's right. I'm going to talk about giving feedback. I think we all typically intend well when we're providing feedback. Yeah, but we suck at it. We fail at the delivery a lot. <laughs> I know. The ability to both give and receive feedback is extremely marketable. And yet, the vast majority of people are like this dude. So the first step to being great at giving feedback is to actually ask for feedback. This is the worst. But it can also increase your self-awareness and how you're showing up to work. And it's super important in empathy, like we talked about. So if asking for feedback terrifies you, I get it, still kind of makes me nervous too, start small. Ask uh, if, the, if the only uh, feedback that you are getting is during a regularly, performance, uh, regularly scheduled performance review or a regularly scheduled code review, you are not getting enough feedback. It doesn't have to be about your performance. It could be about way, uh, communication styles. Start small. Screenshot uh, an email that you know is going to have a wide reach and ask a trusted colleague if there's any way that you can make it better. Screenshot a heated Slack interaction you had with someone and give it to a friend and ask what you maybe have could have done better. Both of these are showing that you care about your performance care about how you want to make yourself better, and sets the stage for other people to start giving you feedback. Now, <clears throat> it's hard for people to give you feedback, and it's hard to convince people to give you feedback, especially actionable feedback, especially if they perceive that feedback to be negative. It's going to require some persistence on your part. When they give you the feedback, repeat it back to them so that they know that you understood what they were saying. Don't interrupt them when they're giving you that feedback. Thank them for that feedback. Implement the feedback. The next step to being great at giving feedback is to give it. This is super terrifying. Uh, the first few times you try to give it, especially if it's in high stakes situations, so start low stakes situations. And if giving feedback makes you nervous, don't worry. I got some resources for you that tell you all about it. So a little feedback 101. The first is to talk face to face. If you are a distributor or remote team, do a quick Google Hangout, Skype, Zoom, whatever your tool of choice is. But I really caution against people trying to provide feedback in written form because humans tend to assume tone even when there's none there. 
There's some pretty cool research that shows that humans uh, doing text only and online communication uh, actually have less satisfaction and less connectedness with their partners than those who do it face to face, even if there's a screen. The second step is to prime the feedback. I like to ask the receiver if they uh, are ready to hear some feedback with, do you have some time for some feedback? Research kind of is a little bit mixed on this step though. Some actually show a lot of positive reviews for a statement. I have some feedback for you. I think it really depends on who you are and how you, how you typically work with some people, but I think this is really important because you are letting the listener know that they are about to hear some feedback. Don't do the feedback sandwich. You know what that is, right? Where you say something nice, then you slip in the negative feedback, and then you say something nice again so that they like you more. Yeah, research shows that that's actually really bad. <clears throat> it's less effective than just being outright and saying the, the negative feedback for a lot of reasons. Uh, the first, oops, sorry, uh, the first is that it's not actually a tool for people receiving the feedback. It's a crutch for people giving the feedback. Those actually receiving the feedback are kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop every time they hear praise. So they don't actually take praise well. The impact of behavior change, if it was negative feedback that requires behavior change, is lessened because it wasn't direct. Just be direct, state your intention to be helpful. The fourth step is to make it timely. If something happened a year ago and you are just providing feedback, I am going to think that you have held it against me for the past year. Similarly, if I did something a year ago and then I did something today, give me feedback on what I did today. Awesome, thanks. This is important. The fifth is to focus on the SBI. Some people call this nonviolent communication, but it makes me a little nervous. So I like to say SBI, situation, behavior, impact. Situation, what happened? Behavior, what they did, impact, how it affected you or the team. Uh, when you were presenting uh, at the exec meeting yesterday, situation. You were unclear and people asked you questions and you didn't have the answer. This made the executives not like, uh, or excuse me, this made the executives be concerned about the type of work coming out of our team. All right, and the last is to follow up when appropriate. If they change it, tell them that you notice that behavior change. Kim Scott book, Radical Candor, goes into this type of feedback uh, more in depth and actually talks about how being too empathetic and kind without directly challenging negative behavior can be ruinous. There's a whole Silicon Valley episode about it too. Yep. And you may think, why do I care about being empathetic when giving feedback? Well, feedback's only as good as the receiver receives it. And teams, uh, or excuse me, companies that encourage honest feedback actually have 270% greater return than teams who don't have that feedback. So we talked about the three parts of empathy, uh, self-awareness, perspective taking, and emotion reappraisal. Uh, I really wanna focus on um, some resources that you can read more about. It's on my GitHub. You can take some personality tests. There are links to that. Um, I'll also tweet about it too. And you can follow some of my Twitter followers if you like punny song lyrics. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>